this is a conspiracy. That's what this is. Just begging to course its way through your veins. Let's just for a moment speculate, shall we? You're into comic books, aren't you? I'm a nerd. But you do like comic books. Comic books aren't just for sad nerds anymore. Do you think we need one more? Strange things are afoot at the Circle K. Do you think we need one more? Objection, calls for speculation, move to strike. This is a bad idea. This is a bad idea! All right, we'll get one more. <laughs> Spectators, a comic book podcast with Jake and Jesus. Hey, 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 what's going on, all you beautiful spectators out there? And welcome to another episode of your favorite comic book podcast, Spectales. I'm your reigning tater tot champion host, Jake, along with the real MVP of the show, the beard with the man attached to it, comic collector of the year in two national polls, and five-time finalist for Astros fan of the year. Hey, Zeus, what is going on? Man, that's that's too much, man. Like, I think, you know, I, I mean, obviously, like, all these are all true accolades, but I just feel like it's just so long winded now, man. I just think you just need to. And, and on top of that, too, finalists, I, I, I feel like I should be the Astros fan of the year. I wear an Astros hat on almost every recording that we have. I don't think anybody else is doing that right now. I can't give you the title if you didn't officially win it. So I do think that uh, a five-time finalist, you know, Houston's a big city, right? I'm assuming the Astros have at least 10 or 20 fans. So to be a finalist, yeah, uh, is a big You know, and that's also important. Like, if you win it once, does it trump five finalists? I don't think so, you know, so... I don't know. If somebody gets to the Super Bowl 10 times, do they celebrate those or do they celebrate the one time they won? I don't know. You know, we're we're mixing sports now. Uh, <laughs> if this is your first time joining us for Spectales, thank you for giving us a listen. Spectales is a comic book podcast that asks collectors and creators, what's your grail tale? Each week, we explore news stories about the comic book grails we love, the epic journeys behind how they were obtained, and how they inspired new creativity. We also dive into some comic book speculation and how, as collectors, we can help the hobby pay for itself. This week, our guest is a proud graduate and valedictorian of the Gordmond Academy of Culinary Combat. He is the author of the upcoming Apex Legends, the official cookbook, and IDW's young adult fantasy graphic novel, Cooking with Monsters. On store shelves right now, actually, by the way, he is Mr. Jordan Al Saka. Jordan, thank you for joining us. Hey, um, thanks so much for having me. I'm super excited to be here and, and talk just comics in general, because it's never a bad time to talk about comics. Ain't that the truth? Ain't that the truth? There's always a good time to talk about comics. Thank you for joining us. And we're also going to talk about some other stuff. I don't want to let the cat out of the bag yet. I kind of mentioned it to Jake and Jake kind of mentioned it as well earlier in introducing you. But I'm a huge Apex player, man. I mean, you see this PlayStation 5 controller right here. That's the only game I play. So I will definitely be picking your brain about Apex. Please, yeah. I'm I'm glad I have something else announced that can I can have an and <laughs> section to my introduction. <laughs> Everything else is still is still on that uh, NDA unannounced zone. So I'm I'm happy to talk that too. Awesome. Awesome. Hey, as you should have seen, hey Zeus, you know, cooking with monsters. We were excited about it. All, all of those, like, we were excited. But today, hey Zeus is like, oh, dude, this guest is gonna be fire. Like, he was all sorts of excited as soon as he realized that you were the author of the Apex Cookbook. That really, that really set it off for him. So I, I, I imagine he's gonna dominate some of the conversation at some point, uh, but not right now, not today, hey Zeus. Right now we've got we've got to get some orig- we've got to get some some comic related items out of out of the uh, out in the open here. So for starters, your book Cooking with Monsters, which is the the young adult graphic novel, is already out on store shelves. Dropped on September the fifth, correct? Yes. And I know that myself because on September the fifth, what was I doing? But I was buying a copy myself actually. Uh, and I, I, I saw it on the shelf. I was like, Oh, yep. This is this one. This is the one, uh, I grabbed it. I grabbed one of the, the books and, uh, and I've already read it. And I, my, uh, 12 year old daughter has already started reading it. So I had to borrow it back from her. 
I don't think we've actually, this isn't a, a real moment we've had on Spectales that often where, you know, we've talked to people before the release of their book, or we've talked to individuals when they're kind of in between projects or, or, but we've never talked to somebody like the week after their book just dropped. How are you feeling about this right now? It's, uh, you know, it's still kind of surreal. This is my first big work. I've done a lot of indie books, self-published, a, a couple of small publisher things, but this, this this was like the real deal, like YA OGN debut, and it didn't really feel real until I actually got to hold it, uh, which just due to the, the short ship time, I, I, I got my copies the same day as stores did, so they were out, I got mine on the 5th. Um, just, just by virtue of, I kept trying... It was a good sign. I kept trying to get copies through friends. Like there were advanced reader copies at ALA. And then they had some like additional promos at Comic-Con. Um, and then anytime a friend would go there, they'd already had run out, which was, was great to hear. But it was a bummer for actually seeing the work in print until release day. <laughs> um, and even then, I, I haven't had a chance to see it on a shelf yet. So I'm glad you did because it it's uh, the copies that our bookstore were going to get got delayed. And they had sold out by the next week, which is all good stuff. Like, I'm not bad about it. I also just like to feel like it's a real book that exists for people to find in the wild. Well, the store that I picked this copy up at last week, I went into today and no more copies. They were all gone. So, I, you know, unless somebody's pilfering them, I believe people are buying. <laughs> uh, and that's that's good news for you, Jordan. Yeah, it's... um. I, I don't know. I mean, again, it's still very early, uh, and and the publisher IDW has they've said it's selling well. I it's again, I have no frame of reference other than I was like checking the Amazon rankings for it, like around release, and it seemed to be doing pretty well. It is still holding solidly against like you know against big things like Scott Pilgrim and um, Minecraft adventure books. So I don't know. I'm I'm hoping it it continues to build an audience uh, mainly because we have two more books and I'd like those to to be successful as well and and just also we'd like to keep making it if we get the chance and to, to tell more stories so uh, yeah no the response so far has been really positive and uh, encouraging that that we'll get to keep doing this for a while congratulations man congratulations Thank a lot of hard work paying off man congratulations Agreed. Very, very cool and very cool about how you met Vivian and, and got the work put together. Uh, I, although I will say, hey, Zeus, you're sort of uh, stealing a little thunder of mine as I as I, I don't want to give anything away, but I, I did have some some questions set up for a later segment on the show. And you sort of jumped that gun uh, in, a, in a sense. But, <laughs> you know, it's it. it you I know think, what? I think so. It's Somebody okay. slow on the trigger. Somebody slow on the trigger. All right. Well, <laughs> I see how it goes. Well, Jordan, uh, are you? Do you feel prepared to jump into this? You ready to go? I'm feeling good. Let's uh, let's hit it off. Awesome. Let's jump right into this first segment. Recent pickups. That's right. The recent pickup segment. Now, hey Zeus. I, I have a, um, I got some feelings about this because I feel like you're going to steal. You always go first on this segment, and I feel like you're going to continue to steal some of my thunder coming up. But reluctantly, I will let you go first again. I'm not going to steal your thunder, man. I, I, I would never do such a thing. I'm not a thunder stealer. Okay, first of all, how dare you? No. Uh, okay, I only have one. Uh, I mean, I have several other things that I'm reading, but I only want to talk about one. And I think I've talked about it recently in, in one of these last episodes because I'm behind and I finally got a chance to catch up a little bit on it. Um, so I'm going to talk about uh, Swan Songs. So I finally got Swan Songs number two from guests of the show, W. Maxwell Prince. And in this issue, it's uh, the artist is Kaspar Wingard. Man, I, I don't know how to say that name. I'm sorry. It's W I J N G A A R D. Okay. Um, and again, you know, he he kind of alluded to this, and he talked about this on the show. It's about swan songs, right? The end of things. Um, and he wanted to do, you know, single issues that tell a story, and he wanted to do it with different artists every issue. Which, in and of itself, I mean, this is an image book, so you know he's doing all the stuff himself, all the all the heavy lifting himself on the back end. 
you know, having to contact the artist, you know, the, the scheduling and, you know, editing, all that, all that jazz. And the first issue was, was Martin Simmons, which is the Department of Truth guy. Um, and I mean, and I don't, I mean, he, he has other great artwork as well, but that's kind of where he's known from, at least that type of artwork. And it, it fit the, the story of that one very well, dystopian future, all that stuff. The second one, Swan Songs, is the, the theme of it is the end of a marriage, right? But if you look at the cover, I mean, I don't know what kind of marriage this is, but it's an intergalactic fight, basically, between yeah. superheroes of that nature or something. Um, the artwork does a lot of really good things in this book. Um, the story is great as well, as, as is expected from Maxwell Prince. Um, but yeah, I think he's I think he's he's kind of stretching his muscles a little bit in this swan song. And it feels like he's he's delving into some other other things. But at the same time, it has that same feel as Ice Cream Man and Ha Ha, uh, but just just slightly different. And it's really cool. It's really cool to read. It's really cool to see uh, the different artwork that goes with it. So I definitely recommend it. This is on my pull list now. Swan songs. I'll be like reading every every one of them uh, this second time I talk about it. But that's what I have for recent pickups. Very nice. I, I'm I'm I've read number one. Have not gotten to number two yet. Uh, very excited. I really love to see the like from discovering W. Maxwell Prince or Will, as we like to call him on the show. From discovering <laughs> Ice Cream Man, uh, and and then watch it and then ha ha and then like literally him making me cry my eyes out with ha ha number four and then five whatever no i was like was it five? <laughs> yeah, it's five. uh and then and then yeah and then seeing this well and and there was art brute which we had discovered yes. in before ice cream man anyway the the trans the 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 growth, the the transition between projects, and I, I just think that his writing is only getting better and better and smarter and smarter. And everybody keeps pushing him and saying this is a this is a horror writer, and everything he's doing is proving you wrong time and time again because he is so much more than that. Uh, I agree with you. Couldn't recommend it more. Uh, man, that is that's that's a four tater tot there. Jesus. Wow. Congratulations. What? Yeah. Four tater tots. <laughs> you did it. Uh, Jordan's looking a little confused. We, we have a one through five tater tot, uh, uh, <laughs> grading scale here. And, uh, Jesus has, uh, in, in two years, he has never won, uh, uh the, the tater tot, uh, game, but this, I I've got a good feeling about today for you. I really do. <laughs> Oh, I'm sure you do, Jake. I'm sure. And by the way, Jordan, Jake is the one who hands out all the tater tots. So you can you can guess why I've never won in two years. <laughs> the system's rigged. All right, no, no, yeah. that's fair. Um, <laughs> I will say I haven't I haven't read Swan Songs, but I, I have read Ice Cream Man. It's been a minute, but uh, that's the sort of thing I love to hear about art or writers getting to or creators just in general getting to show that they're not just one thing, uh, because it does feel like. You know that that that's always been one of my big concerns is to to come out with with one book and then that becomes the defining note of my whole career. When I think most writers want to just like expand and do all kinds of things because that's what's fun is just to do something you've never done before. Uh, so it makes me want to check that book out as soon as I can. Nice, very cool. Uh, well, Jordan, this is your moment. You're next up on the recent pickups uh part of this segment so i'm gonna go ahead and uh ask you what what do you recently what have you recently read or picked up or what would you like to share uh well i have a, i have a few things but i think the big one is since it is also a ya book i've really been enjoying i'm not quite finished with it but i picked up uh danger and other unknown risks by um ryan north and erica henderson which if uh, those names sound familiar, it's probably from their Marvel work. They did a lot of issues of Unbeatable Squirrel Girl. I forget exactly where Erica Henderson left mm. the book. But that was one of the one of my favorite Marvel books of the past decade. I think um, right around that time, they were really leaning into um, a little lighter, more fun, more accessible characters, and, and just letting creators kind of have fun with it. 
And uh, I don't think anyone has more fun than Ryan North when it comes to just creating wild, crazy concepts. Um, and so uh, Danger and Other Unknown Risks is all about a world where the apocalypse actually happens on Y2K and magic has become a real thing and it's super dangerous. Um, and it's about a, uh, I'm forgetting the character's name. Oh yeah, Marguerite and her canine pal Daisy. They kind of have to go and venture through all these magical zones to uh, fix things. And my biggest worry, honestly, I was a little worried going into this book just because if you have read Unbeatable Squirrel Girl, it's a super dense comic. Like each issue of that book could take, like you could probably get through four or five issues of another uh, Marvel DC book in the time it takes to like just read all the dialogue, all the little like liner notes, um, look at all the art details. Um which I really like for that, but I was like, "Oh, is this going to be is this going to be super dense at a at a two hundred page count?" Uh, but they they really adapt really well to the form. It flows really smoothly, and it's just a fun coming of age tale. Which, unsurprisingly, I am a big fan of. Uh, mm-hmm. I love seeing characters grow. I love teenage protagonists. It's a genre I've worked in a lot, um, and it's just again, it's fun seeing how other character other writers put characters through those situations. So. Um, I think this is, it's probably done well. It I, I think it was like a, a bestseller several times over, or at least it was sold out in my store. I know that. Um, but it's just a really fun YA adventure graphic novel. I would I would recommend. Uh, yeah. And, I mean, that sounds awesome. And, and I, I did read the, the Squirrel Girl books. Uh, but I was, what I was going to ask you is, um, is that, do you normally gravitate towards like graphic novels and things of that nature versus like individual floppies and things like that? It's funny you'd say that because I would say for the past probably decade, just for accessibility for a while, not having a comic shop nearby after we uh, moved for the first time. Yeah, it kind of became I I trade weighted and also just for space. I like in college. I was in the comic. There were actually my my, the main road of my college had two separate comic shops on it and they both did well. (laughs) <laughs> so I could go to two different shops for two different experiences because they they kind of carried separate different things. They would they would they would get like big two stuff, but then one was a little more indie, a little more local. Um, and so I could just be in there like every week, get my books. Probably way too many. I mean, this was around the time that Spider Man was shipping three times a month during Brand New Day. The oh, New Fifty Two launched when I was in college, so it was very easy to to for things to quickly become a problem. Uh, but then, yeah, after college, once we moved, it it became, I would trade weight for a lot of stuff. I didn't have as much space. But recently, having a comic shop again and having a lot more friends who are doing books, I've, I've started to get pulled back to floppies a lot more than I, I thought I was done for. I thought I was out. Uh, they pulled me back in. Um, <laughs> and one of the big ones was the, I've really been enjoying IDW Star Trek stuff, um, both of those series. And then uh, kind of the same way that the New 52 brought in brought me in as a, a reader for DC regularly. I'd been reading before that, but that was like where it was just an easy jumping on point. I've been enjoying a lot of the Rebirth stuff. Like I just picked up uh, both uh, Birds of Prey number one and um, Fire and Ice and had a great time with those. And uh, I'm looking forward to the new Wonder Woman. There's just... It, it's again, now that I'm going to the, it's, it's the problem. It's proximity, right? You go into a shop and you see 30 awesome looking covers and, and interesting concepts and you can't help but be like, I'll I'll get, I'll get a few this week. And and then I'll wait for the trade. Then you're like, well, second issue's here. Might as well. Um, So I'm, I'm right on the verge of starting a pull again, like full. Nice. Nice. Well, uh, I'm going to go ahead and jump into my recent pickup. It's probably not a surprise to anybody uh, seeing that one, I've kind of already mentioned it. And two, uh, you know, we are blessed with Jordan joining us right now. My recent pickup is Cooking with Monsters, which I picked up off the shelf at my LCS on September the 5th when it was released. And I read through it. And like I said, my my daughter is already through my 12 year old is already through it. Um, and I, I think it'll probably make its rounds throughout my house. This book is going to be well loved by the time it's all said and done. Um, ultimately, Jordan, I, I would I would love to butcher the synopsis uh, in front of you, 
Uh, but I think that we would be doing you no, <laughs> no justice <laughs> at all if I did that. Would you mind, for our listeners, giving the quick pitch about what your Cooking with Monsters is? Absolutely. I uh, I haven't done this a lot, so let allow allow the the, the creator to butcher it. Um, <laughs> so, <laughs> Cooking with Monsters is the story mainly of Hana Ozawa, who is a young girl from a small village who uh, goes to the city of uh, Gourmet City in the the capital of Gourmand to attend the Gourmand Academy of Culinary Combat. Uh, her goal is to become a warrior chef who are heroes that travel the land, both fighting monsters and then making meals out of them for the uh, population that they're protecting. Uh, She goes there with her best friend, Bobby, and they are both looking forward to seeing their hero, Ara Song, who is the chef that saved them from a basilisk when they were children. Uh, And then upon arriving, they immediately meet a whole cast of characters, um, other class members, the top of the class, their instructors, and an, and one of their old uh, bullies who came to the school a year ahead of them, and uh, as the story progresses, it is it covers the first year of Hana's education as she develops a rival, rivalry with uh, again head of class Olivia. There's a lot of tension between them. There's secrets that come out. I mean, it's everything I, I hope it's everything you would want from a YA high school set uh, action romantic uh, comedy. I would say I, I never call it a comedy, but I would like to think it is very funny. It is certainly very punny. So if you if you do not mind a lot of <laughs> food puns, I, I think you'll have a good time. But uh, that is the the rough gist. It is about, and it's also about Hana uh, coming to terms with what it means for her to be a chef and uh, kind of rediscovering her love for her her own cultural cuisine by the end. So let's get into it though. Lots of monsters, lots of fighting and fun. Uh, mixed in with the the high school stuff, right? But it never, ever, I feel like, gets too caught up in any one part of what it is. And I think that's a positive. It's paced so well. You're reading through it. You're getting the monster. Uh, Jesus and I are big on kaiju and monsters, and we love those sort of things. And the fantasy involved in this always is, is constant, you never forget the world. Uh, the world, holy, we forgot about world building. Uh, I'm a big fan of world building. This, I know you said there's two other books already, but seriously, this is an entire environment. This is an entire world. The school itself, like this is Hogwarts. If you were, you know, <laughs> within, it's another, you know, it's another level of world building that I think goes beyond just these characters, but any character that's been through the school, uh, her mentor, what you could just do a whole, uh, a whole thing on him, right? Wonderful character. Anyway, uh, I digress. I have questions for you. First of all, this is <laughs> clearly and very obviously manga inspired. Is there a more specific manga that you were that that you had in mind? Did you guys ever consider doing this uh, manga style like back to front? Uh, and, and is this being sold internationally? It, like lots of questions. <laughs> uh, I will I will do my best. Uh, as far as th- I think the biggest inspiration, I, I I'd like to quote My Hero Academia or Naruto because they I think have the most obvious parallel um but really the the one that i always come back to and it's probably my favorite uh manga is hunter hunter just okay. because i love which which also starts with an entrance exam so i actually do think yeah it, it, you can kind of see the parallel there but i just love how that world at least early on because i i think as it goes it, it definitely leans a little more into like traditional shonen tropes but i like how it's kind of weird and wacky and you never know what's around the next corner um and there's even there are even like chef hunters early in that book where they are uh they one of their first challenges is oh you have to go harvest this very hard to get ingredient and then make it perfectly um and so i just liked the idea of of yes the traditional thing is oh we're gonna go fight a monster to protect a village or we have to fight you know an evil alien um i just like finding the 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 extraordinary in mundane scenarios which i think hunter hunter does well a lot of the time um i mean it has a whole arc that's set at an auction and that's a very fun 
like setting to to do weird, cool, crazy stuff with. And my hope is that we we get to keep doing that and keep coming up with fun, creative locations. Um, I think we we wanted it to we wanted to play to the market because I, I don't think we, we never want to be like, oh, yeah, we made an American shonen because that wasn't our goal. We don't want to like um, be like, yeah, we made a shonen because I, I think there are certain elements that are very culturally significant and, you know, are, are Japanese exclusive to where no, we're making an American comic, but we are also kids that grew up watching uh i can't vivian's from the uk i don't know if they had tudabi necessarily but whatever <laughs> whatever the the uk equivalent of tudabi and midnight run um would be like that's where i spent a lot of my saturday nights or my afternoons after school was watching stuff like that so it's very influential on the type of stories i want to tell just because it's what i loved as a kid and i i hope that the book speaks to a similar like oh yeah this is the sort of stuff i love energy um, and then as far as international, that is something that I think is in the works. It's it's sort of at IDW's level. Um, but I believe the goal is again, if it's successful enough, we'll we'll get to do more internationally. I would like I would love to see it uh get as big an audience as possible. But I think right now it is because I know right now it's focused on US market. Um and then uh so so yeah, that's I would say where they are all at. And the reason I asked the international question is because I, I do feel like this could easily just be transitioned and sold in any other language, any other region of the, the world. Uh, and I think that just speaks to how universal the characters feel. I, I, I'm, I'm glad to hear that. I, I think one of the biggest, um, I think it's very clear, you know, the idea of all of these different cultures, it's, it, it, I mean, it's a melting pot nation. It's very based on America in that respect. Mm -hmm. And one of the things we wanted to do, especially with the characters and all the different cultures is like food is so intimately tied to culture that we didn't just want to go, oh yeah, these are the, you know, Arab characters because they're from the desert and they're, <laughs> we're saying they are. Uh, it's why, you know, Hana is from, Hadaki and Bobby is from um, Trang, and now I'm worried I'm mixing up character <laughs> locations. I don't believe so, um, but but they are all from the archipelago, and we wanted it to be like, oh yeah, they are all what you know, they're all Asian, but they are all from different countries. But here in Gorman, they might just get generalized. Um, and we did the same thing with like I'm I'm pa of Palestinian descent, so I didn't just want to be like, oh, these are generic Arab characters. It's like, oh, they are very specifically based on being Palestinian and being um, uh, refugees and having to flee their home. And so we wanted to make sure that even though it is a fantasy setting, the cultures still ring true to what they are based on, which will hopefully tie, be obvious by the fact that all the foods are still pretty much the same. But but again, it's very important. Cult food food is very cultural. Um, mm -hmm. And and yeah, we, we wanted to make sure that the characters ring true for any readers who um, might might relate to them. Yeah, well, I, I mean, I think that's a like a huge, at least selling point for me is food, right? Like, I love food, as, as you can tell, I love food. <laughs> um, but tying food with uh with monsters, I think, was such a unique and creative uh thing idea that I hadn't really seen. I've only seen it done, I guess, once, uh, but it was in a short novel form. I was telling Jake about this um a few weeks ago. Uh, it's called I forgot what it's called, but it's by Matt Wallace. They're, they're, they're novel no, novellas. They're small novellas, but it's just cool. It's just a cool theme, cool, cool thematic. And, and the artwork on it, I feel, I mean, it's really good. It does remind me a lot of manga. Um, and so my, my question that I had was, you know, what, what made you or what made the decision to do a graphic novel versus like, you know, a, a standard comic issue and to do it in monthly installments or things of that nature? Was it just IDW or was that something you went into it? specifically wanting to do a, a graphic novel so originally it started as um i think the very first version is it's either a five or a six issue miniseries um and this this is like very early when it was when it was me just like a new writer writing an entire miniseries just to, to prove i could do it um and so uh that is how we pitched it for the longest time we but we, we also we were very open to fitting the story to whoever might be interested in it. 
So yeah, we did a lot of miniseries pitching. We pitched it to Webtoon at one point and we were like, okay, how could we break this up into episodes if if they were to be interested in it and pick it up? Um, and then even when, when IDW came, I was, when the editor emailed, I was like, oh yeah, here's our miniseries because you're IDW and you don't do graphic novels. Um, and then, you know, she was like, no, actually we're looking to do more graphic novels. Would you be interested in doing this as a graphic novel? And we were like, yeah, absolutely. And it worked out really well because the the miniseries, even at that point, I think the miniseries, we, we were trying to pitch a seven issue miniseries, which was a long shot regardless. Um, but doing it as a graphic novel, we got way more pages. We got to do it at 252. Uh, we got to really let the characters have more room to to breathe and get to know each other and not have to worry about strict chapter breaks. Um, and so it, it honestly, the experience of, of pitching it affected how I've, I've structured pitches going forward because I've been a lot more open of like, oh, yeah, this could be a miniseries. It could be a graphic novel. There's usually a preference. Like, like there are some things I would love to have a serialized work. I would like to do more OGNs. But it was also just at the time, like, and even still, I think it's clear how big the YA OGN market has gotten as more book publishers have gotten into the game. Mm-hmm. And so it feels to a certain extent like this is meeting young adult readers or, or certainly the kids that are young adult readers where they're at, where where they're going to, you know, find these books in the sections of the bookstore that are labeled specifically to, oh, you're a YA reader. Here are those graphic novels. Um, and it's just it's a nice it's a nice format. It's um, it, it's it allows for a lot of um, just freedom. And so I really enjoyed working in that. And that is why, yeah, I, IDW wanted to be a graphic novel. Uh, if they'd wanted it to be any number of things, we probably at that, again, we'd be pitching for a while. We, yeah. we were ready to tell it however they wanted. Uh, but we're happy with where it ended up. That's awesome. That's awesome. That's good to hear. I, you know, the pitching stuff is, is very interesting to me, obviously. Um, but so whenever you, you, I guess IDW, the editor emailed you, how long did it take from that point to September 5th, whenever it launched? Uh, so the, the path was, and it was like early December. We talked with the editor through that month. She kind of explained, oh yeah, IDW is, we're looking for more graphic novels. We, we'd like, we'd be interested. They, they actually, they came back with an offer pretty quick and we, we considered it over the holidays and we were just like, I think we had our response and we were just like, we we'd like to, but we would, <laughs> we would like more money. I mean, we were honest, <laughs> we needed, we needed more money. And we were like, you know, we would love to do it. We would hopefully get this much. And it was at that point they came back. We were nervous. Obviously we were like, well, they're going to say no now. Um, but they came back. They were like, yeah, we can do that. And we're going to, if you are interested, we would like to do it for three books now, uh, which was, I think the first sign that they were, really confident in the idea because the first book and I think it's still there we rewrote we rewrote it to be more a little open-ended at the end but we really when we were pitching it we were like no this is this is probably all we're gonna get to do because it's a mini series we want it to be a complete story um, and I, I I think the first book still mostly tells a complete story there's definitely some like hints of where things are gonna go and some some question marks left but uh, it, it is. It was meant to be its own story. That's why it covers the whole first school year. Um, and then from that, I think it was about five months of of waiting because the gears turned slowly of of waiting to hear back, waiting for editorial to go through everything, or waiting on the management side. But it was by May or June of 2021 that we we signed, and then it's kind of just been production since then. I I started writing the script. And then it went to Vivian or after we did rewrites. And while she was working on book one, I'd eventually got back to me starting book two and that, and currently she is inking book two while I am finishing up book three's script. Uh, do, do you have an announced date for book two? Not officially. If I'm, I'm assuming we are currently looking fall next year, but there's not like a set date. Okay. Um, but but we're we're going on again. We're about a year of production time for each book. So uh, ideally, it, it might move just because schedules. But but I'm I'm hoping we'll we'll stay at a, a book a year and and get it out fairly quickly. Um, 
Nice. Because I, one of the other things I really like, I, and again, this would, this would be more effective if we, if we do get to do more than three books, but I really want, I hope that it can age up with an audience, like as it goes, like some of the best YA book series have done and, and be something that they can mature with. But uh, that's, that's the really big pie in the sky hope where we're a, a smash hit. <laughs> nice. Well, I, I would be very interested in seeing that happen. I'm excited to see what happens next. Uh, in book two, I will be following along with the, with you and the characters. Uh, so thank you very much for, for sharing that with us. Uh, man, what a hell of a recent pickup segment this was, Jesus. Um, <laughs> and, and, you know, because of how wonderful our guest is, how amazing this book is, I have no choice but to give myself five tater tots for the segment, <laughs> uh, thus keeping intact my undefeated record. And but it was, I mean, hell of a valiant effort. Four tater tots for Jesus, record breaking for a Jesus record. So good for everybody involved. Uh, we'll see, Jake. We will see. <laughs> All right. That does, however, bring us to our next segment. Grail tale. Grail tale. Grail tale. Grail tale. Grail tale. The Grail tale segment. This one happens to be our favorite segment because Jesus and I just put our feet up, get our pina coladas, and uh, and we listen to Jordan talk all about his Grail tale. Jordan, what do you got? Okay, so I, I have two that I, I hope will be interesting because one is from the as a creator side and one is from the as a collector side. Um, and the, the, the creator side is very easy. Um, as a creator who came up like late 2000s, early 2010s, um, one of my big grails would be to have a cover done for a book um, by uh, Jenny Frisson, who has done just countless gorgeous uh, covers for uh, DC, a lot of independent books like Image, where I think she did every book cover for Revival. Um, I'm pretty sure. Uh, and just even as I've I've started working and had a had a first, I, I've I've I made my first attempt where we had a book uh, that is going to have variant covers, and we reached out and we got some very. I want to be clear, we got some amazing talent that is going to do variant covers for this unannounced book. But Jenny Frizzen was not available. Um, but her art has just always... Like, I look at it and I go, oh, that's a comic cover. That's a great image. Um, and so I would love to one day have that. And I would love to own the original, however much it would no doubt cost. Probably quite a bit. <laughs> um, but yeah, just as far as cover artists go... I mean, there's a lot of great ones, but but she's always been one of my favorites. So if it can ever happen, uh, that would that would be my... that would, that would that would take the cake as far as that goes. Nice. Nice. Very so cool. Frisson, when did, when did, cause she, she also did something skin with children books too. That's, that's where I, I kind of remember her from, but she's done a bunch of, of great, um, wh wh which one kind of like put you onto her? Like which one was one of the first, was the revival that you mentioned? Revival is one of the ones where it, it, that's the one where I really noticed. And I think took notice of the work, but like retroactively, again, I think there was a lot of DC work that I was like, oh, she did this or, or has gone on to do other stuff. Um, and it's just, it, I mean, it's the line work. It's, there's, there's a very specific, like, I'm trying to think of the right texture, I guess, to the way her work is frequently colored. It just feels very uniquely cover art. Like, I, I, I like cover art that will look like, oh, this is just another, it, it fits right in with the book. But I, I like something that goes, oh, this is a little, it's a little fancier, a little more like stylized. And I don't know, I've just always enjoyed the 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 look of her work in a way that I would really like to see one of the, the characters I've created uh, portrayed in her style. Awesome. That's a great grail. You're going to have to let us know when that uh, when that grail is achieved. Please, please let us know. We're going to we'll, we'll mark a checkbox. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> All right. And you said you also have the the collector in you also has a grail. Yeah, and this is this is like a mix of several things because it's a mix of uh, having to not having to, but but getting rid of my early early like childhood comic collection, and knowing that it is 
almost guaranteed impossible to ever happen from a legal standpoint. But the thing I would love to see is um, all of the old Archie Sonic comics get collected. Um, that is the book that got me into comics. I uh, I mean, there are a lot of books along the way, right? Because because there's no yeah, like, of course. There, you, you kind of ease in. So like the mainstream books was Runaways. I saw issue six of Runaways on the stand and the cover spoke to me and and that kind of got me into Marvel and Big Two. And then when I was in college, um, it was Incredible Hercules and the Marvel cosmic stuff that DNA were doing. But when I was, I think, like eight years old, um, there was there was a comic, there was a spinner rack at the mall and it had an issue of Sonic the Hedgehog on it. And I was a huge Sonic fan. My mom bought me a Genesis when I was, like, I don't even think old enough to really play it yet, because <laughs> I just remember <laughs> it being there. Um, but I read that book for years. I read it right up till it got canceled. And uh, they there were there were spotted collections of the early stuff and in some of the later years. But once it switched over to IDW, typically you think of IDW as like, oh, they're going to take all the old stuff and they're going to put out these nice archives like they did for Transformers or G.I. Joe. Uh, but the the unfortunate thing about Sonic is due to some contract weirdness, the writer who wrote a huge chunk of like the middle section of that run still had all of the legal rights to all the characters he created. And that I don't wow. think that is inherently bad. I think creators getting their rights or, or being able to have rights to the characters created is not a bad thing. I, I just think from a company level, that is obviously Archie Slippin. <laughs> um, <laughs> But as a result, and as a result of all the legal loopholes, like they had to reset the universe to basically remove every character he created and kind of start from scratch. Uh, wow. And as a result, there's just there's no no reprints. Um, I don't know the super intense details of the legal side, but I have to imagine that that would be the big roadblock to ever seeing like a definitive collection of those like. 290 some issues plus all the miniseries and and spinoffs they did uh, that many holy cow yeah it is i i think he still holds the record for longest running video game oh character comic God. um wow yeah, was, i did not know that yeah knuckles the echidna had a 32 issue series so i mean <laughs> the, the, it ran yeah um, and and it's also it's a relic of a time when studios didn't care as much about brand integration. So there are just a lot of really weird, messed up stories that I don't know that I would, you know, you wouldn't want to see them today. But as a kid, you're like, you'll see characters in that book that their friends die of an overdose. Oh. In a <laughs> um, and again, it's because nope. Sega was not at the wheel. They were like, you know, yeah, you could have the license. Do whatever you want. Um, and and uh, again, there are other ones too, because I think when IDW put out this week, I think, Sonic's 900th Adventure, and that's like counting IDW's run and Archie's run, and there was a separate UK run of Sonic comics. Um, so, so there have been, as of now, over 900 individual, like, different issues of sonic the hedgehog um it's like so certain... or go it, ahead. yeah i was gonna say it's like you know batman superman you know the flash captain america and then sonic for the longest runs in, in comic yeah it's wild world. uh you wouldn't think it but there, there's like for me because i read it so consistently it's like there's there's a level at which I think of Sonic more as a comic character than a video game character a lot of the time. Oh, wow. That's... Um, but again, because I, I had those books for so long, I unfortunately, when we, it was in a move, like it always is, and you're like, I got to downsize, I have too many comics, and I sold just a huge chunk of them. I, I fortunately still have, I have like 50 issues of it, which is, for most, again, for most video game comics, you would think covers it. Um, but I, I still have those issues. And I, I love having them, but I, but it's a bummer knowing that if I wanted to put that collection back together, it's pretty much going through back bins or going on eBay where they can go for, I mean, a lot per issue. Like it, it is, it is, it has a huge fan base still. Um, and again, I'm I'm a huge fan of IDW's run. I still read it. I'm I, I love the character, and it's just it's kind of one of my comfort books. Um, but my grail would be, yeah, let's like somebody finally figuring it out. And, and putting out like that complete collection of those those books but it is 
very unlikely to be, unfortunately. You know, the 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 whole contract thing to me always is something kind of interesting and and the same thing like with Hulk not having his own movie because of some sort of you know distribution with you know whoever universal and then I think Ant was something as well like the the character Ant with Eric Larson eventually buying it from the original uh creator like all that stuff is is really interesting I I had no idea one that Sonic had that many as a as a video game char- character and two that that I mean, that I mean, can we at least like celebrate the win of the creator that got the rights somehow? Whenever no creator was getting rights for for comic for comic book characters that they were creating, can we do? Do we even know who who is it? Do you know who it is? Yeah, his name is Ken Penders. He there's a whole there's a whole lot on him just as a creator, and he has his own issues. But yes, as a creator, it's like if I created something for Marvel or DC, and I had the chance to like hold on to those rights and get paid properly if they wanted to use it. Yeah. I mean, it's the same thing. Cause it's what's, I think even today on social media, there was a lot of talk about Alan Moore and, you know, how he's just, you know, been, uh, you know, screwed over on Watchmen for like 40 years now because they just don't let it go out of print. So from the, from the strictly like creator versus corporation level. Yeah. You, you want to, to hope that the the little guy can get the win, but again, it's, it's such a, I mean, again, I could go four hours on, on Sonic's weirdness, um, uh, especially at the creator level. But but yeah, it, it's it's one of those situations that as a collector, as someone who would love to read those stories again, um, not on like a torrent or something, but uh, just actually to have physical copies, um, it, it's a bummer. And I hope one day maybe it can happen. Still holding out hope. Yeah, got to <laughs> keep hope alive. There is nothing wrong with holding on to a hope. Absolutely not. Uh, Jordan, thank you very, very much for sharing those, those grails with us. We are going to wish you the best. And if there's any way we can help you achieve those things, I don't think we have any say in either of those, but if we can do anything to help you achieve those, please let us know. We do have ourselves a little bit of a, an ongoing, whenever somebody comes on and they tell us uh, something, which we actually, we would, probably describe that as like a whale right that white whale you're chasing after uh yeah. we we try to help people uh but i will say we haven't had a lot of luck yet uh, <laughs> we're still trying to chase down an original uh manga issue of jaws uh oh, wow. which is i mean man that we uh that was that was a that's couple a real, years. that's a that's a whale, that's man. a big white whale uh yeah. but we got close we got close to that one uh but still mm-hmm. nothing Anyway, that that concludes the Grail Tale segment of the show, which can only mean we are getting to speculation. The speculation segment. This is a segment where we're going to go over something that we think you should look into from a comic book collectible value standpoint. Uh, we are both collectors. We are both individuals that will sometimes need to help the hobby pay for itself so that we can uh, maybe get the grails that we want. We'll sell a couple of books and knowing where that value might be certainly could help you uh, in your collecting days uh, there at home. So, hey, Zeus, once again, you traditionally go first. So I'm going to turn the mic over to you. All right, man, I've been waiting for this uh, the entire show to talk about this specifically. Um, huge, huge Apex player, huge Apex nerd. Uh, so when I, when I found out Jordan was the writer of the official cookbook for Apex Legends, which, again, I'm a huge nerd. I watched the professional Apex, which the finals champs just happened this past weekend of, of, as of this recording, which is uh, the 13th of, of September. I, and they were promoting this cookbook on the finals. They really were. Uh, did you Did you know that, Jordan? I did not. I, I've seen it promoted on social now that they've started, but I did not know that. That's that's wild to hear. They promoted it on Champs, and just so you know, I think at the time that they were promoting it, there was a on at least on YouTube because I watched it on YouTube. There was at least twenty seven thousand people watching when they were promoting it. So I thought that was pretty cool. So it got me to thinking. You know, there's a lot of games like we talked about Sonic going over comic books. Has Apex had a comic book? And lo and behold, Apex has had a comic book in uh, 2021. 
Apex Legends Overtime number one of four. It's a four issue miniseries from Dark Horse Comics. So Apex Legends Overtime one. I mean this 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 is this game has been around for four years. It's a battle royale. It the the following in my opinion is growing. I'm saying that because I'm biased. Obviously, I play it a lot. Um, but it is. I I really do feel it is that that it is growing. It's it's getting its legs under it. Four years of of professional uh, apex, um, I guess competition plus just a regular uh, folks that play it like myself and my friends and my buddies. So I definitely think that this um, does have legs to grow in the future. It's a dollar bin book. You're gonna find this book in the dollar bins. Apex Legends Overtime number one, the first time Apex Legends. Um, comes out in a comic book form. That's the first one. And the second one, I'd be remiss if I did not say the Apex Cookbook that comes out on October 17th, 2023 by our friend here, Jordan. It's a, One, it's a collectible. I mean, I, I you know me, man. I, I love unique things uh, to promote things and to, you know, weave things in. And a cookbook for Apex, I never thought would be something that I would want, but now I do want it. And I do want to create those those culinary treats from some of my favorite characters. Um, so I definitely, I definitely put that on my list um, for speculation as well. So, um, but I, I also wanted to ask since, since we're here, we're talking about yeah. apex. Cause how, how did you get involved with the apex, um, you know, cookbook writing it? And then also like, you know, what kind of research did you do for it? So uh, this is one where I have to hugely credit uh, Maeve McLeisot, who is my agent um, who uh, represented my book Raise Hell when we were pitching that. And then I've stayed with her and, and, you know, I kind of, I, I went to her and was like, you know, I want to do more licensed work. I want to do, there are a lot of IPs I want to work on. And we put together like a list of, Oh, here's, here's all the stuff. I feel like I have enough knowledge of uh, to, to be interested if there are opportunities that come up. And I think it was a few months later, uh, I think it was like s- July or s- August of last year was when when she was like, "Hey, there are a couple of franchises uh, that that Inside Editions was is the publisher. They're looking to do cookbooks based on these things. Do you think you would be any good for either of them?" And uh, of them, I was like, "Yeah, Apex. I play it. Um, I, I, you know, I wasn't. It wasn't a daily thing because I, I haven't had friends to game with like regularly in a while, but." I was like, yeah, when it came out, we spent, I think, weeks playing it. And then we we pop in every every couple of months when a new season would start to see the new character. Um, and I was just like, yeah, I would, I would like, I would be interested. I don't know what that would look like because I had never <laughs> I knew licensed cookbooks existed, but I I I never like thought, oh, I could write that. <laughs> it it just had never like entered my my mind as a thing I would work on. And so for research, it was really just playing a lot of apex <laughs> um and reading what i could find because uh what was really nice about going into apex with with again a solid knowledge base but not being super well versed in the lore is that it's it's of all the battle royales it's probably got the most robust well considered lore and also i was a big titanfall fan like i i really mm-hmm. love titanfall too mm-hmm. Um, so getting to be back in this universe and seeing like descendants of some of those characters or again, some of those characters just older and, and more successful. Um, but that's what I did. I, I replayed Titanfall 2 because I wasn't sure at first, are we going to make Titanfall 2 references or is it going to be purely Apex Legends? Um, and then I played a lot because you can read a lot of the lore, but but I, one of the things that makes Apex great is the way the different champions will banter with each other when they're in a match and you can get a lot of character mm-hmm. from that. Um, and then Dark Horse had actually put out just a full lore book that was also written from Pathfinder's point of view where he goes around talking to like all the champions that were released at that point. It, it, it was, I, th- this was over a year ago. So I think it was like three or four champions earlier. Uh, so not every character was in the book, but um, it just, it let me get right in his head. Uh, because it was like it was a whole 200 plus page book written in pathfinder's point of view so when i went to just write the blurbs and and yeah just for clarity i i wrote the lore entries there was a separate chef who did all the recipes i am not that talented um unfortunately (laughs) um but we worked in conjunction where he had come up with a bunch of recipes 
And I kind of had, here's what they're going to be. Let's flavor them. Some of them were already tied to certain characters based on, you know, either in-game lore or just kind of what they'd come up with. And then others I kind of got to tie to characters that I thought it would fit with. The hard, the only really hard part was it was actually, bef- I was working on it before Catalyst was announced. Hmm. But there were still re- Catalyst recipes in the book. So for a few months, I was like putting those off and I was just like, can you tell <laughs> Can you tell me anything official? Because I'm seeing leaks, but I don't feel like, I don't know if those are official. And then I think it was like three days before the manuscript was due, the the Catalyst premiere trailer came out and it was like, all right, I guess I'll base it off of this. Um, (laughs) Wow. Yeah. No, I I agree with you when you said that that BR has a lot of lore. I think that's why I like it as well. I'm always reading the lore on it and just, just, just really interesting. Uh, But last question and probably the most important one, uh, is who who's your main? Who do you main on on Apex? Uh, it's it's Loba. I I really like the ability to just get the guns I want. <laughs> um, just <laughs> by by throwing the black the bazaar down and being like, all right, I'm gonna I'm gonna get the the uh, highest level gun and shield right away, <laughs> and I'm gonna feel safe. Uh, and also, I just I, her mobility options really good for for getting out of situations. Her, her escape, yeah, her thief thing, yeah. Pretty good. I, I didn't picture you as as a Loba. Uh, I would. I would. I don't know. Maybe Pathfinder. I thought since you you you've been in his brain, but I like Loba. That. It's it's the it's the you know you play those first six free characters like six thousand times, and yeah. you get a little sick of them after. Yeah. <laughs> that is true. That is true. All right, that, 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 that's all I I had. I'm sorry, Jake, that I took over and it became a gaming. Uh, Ow, podcast you, you've been you've been on a on a roll the last few weeks you you got your manga going on now you've got gaming i it's the jesus show but i mean yeah, we're, we're supposed to talk about stuff we like right jake I mean, that hey that i i didn't mean it negatively i apologize if it came <laughs> off that way uh jordan you're up next for this speculation segment do you have something to to bring up you want to talk about i'm it's always it's tricky because again because i do so much like trade waiting i don't i don't think as much in the singles market but i I think what i would give is general advice i guess on on the things that have been in my collection is it's like look for those artists that are if if you're looking for something that's going to gain value i think look for the artists that aren't super big yet but are doing covers right like that are getting started they're doing variants because really all it takes is that one big hit and and suddenly they're going to be you know shoot through the moon the book i always think of is like and this isn't necessarily covers or anything, but I remember when Chu came out again, when I was in college in the first issue, I, I just bought it because it looked interesting. And then suddenly I think they were on like fifth printing and the, the first issue printing had shot like through the roof because everybody wanted to read the book. And I was like, I guess I have a valuable book now. Um, and so there's also that level of like, just, you know, read what you want, try things out. I, I always say, I know a lot of comics is big too. I love my share of DC and Marvel, but Especially ever, I I think ever since like the image boom of the early 2010s, it's like there's just so many other options and so many other genres out there. And uh, you never know who's going to blow up or or whose miniseries is going to become the next big thing. So um, just try stuff you like. And and eventually you're probably just you're just sheer luck going to stumble into something that'll be worth holding on to. (laughs) The, the the Warren Buffett angle, right? Like Warren Buffett says, invest in what you like, you know, collect what you like and read and what you like to read and it'll pop off one day. Yeah. Well, no disagreement there. All right. No, that's that's perfect. That'll do. I think that's good advice. Uh, I will close out this speculation segment by kind of going over something that's i don't think new to anybody else but something that i i learned today uh because of a recent pickup uh that creep show number 1 uh which just dropped today uh you can go and get it on your your store shelves it's it's creep show number 1 of volume 2 so they did a first run they're doing the the second run but it was interesting to me because I picked up Creep Show number one because I like horror comics. I like reading, you know, the the darker stuff. Uh, so I usually try to pick that stuff up. Everybody listening already knows that. But the reason collectors are are already sort of 
picking this up and Jesus, you nodded when I said it. So I think you maybe already know, uh, there's a preview in it for transformers. Number one. And this is something that, that is interesting. The preview, uh, especially for a book that really doesn't need a preview. It is so hyped. Like uh, personally speaking, I can't go anywhere on Instagram or Twitter without getting inundated with all of the covers and all everybody hyping it up saying that it is dark night level good. Uh, it is character. It is it, it, characters defining characters because there's multiple transformers. Maybe mm-hmm. I don't know, but it is, it is that level of defining moment for these characters. So the, the, Clear obvious would be to tell you, hey, maybe you guys should get your hands on, you know, a copy or two of Transformers, but also knowing they're going to be printing a ton of these things. There's going to be, this is going to be X-Men number one level print <laughs> printout. Uh, Skybound is, I don't know, they, uh, they probably already have a million. I don't know how many they're printing, but they've got a lot. Uh, and that's... Cool. That's awesome. Congrats to Skybound and, and Image, and, and it's going to do well. But the preview feels like an old school thing to do, right? Yeah. Like I, I, I think back to, I don't know, like the, the preview for me, it, like I think of Ninja Turtles because in the 80s they did a preview and that preview was worth some money. Uh, but the fact that they did the preview in Creep Show, which I don't particularly feel like, like that's an instant crossover. But then again, maybe, I don't know, maybe they also were like, hey, Creepshow needs a little bit of help. Well, we'll put that Transformers uh, (laughs) preview in it. Either way, I picked it up prior to knowing there was a preview in it. I think it's a good book to maybe hold on to. It's one of those things where I feel like Transformers print run is going to be very, very high. That preview might, might hold a little value. Yeah, man. So I, a couple of things that I'll just reiterate that you said, um, you know, I, I haven't had anticipation for something for a comic book like this in a while. I do have a lot of anticipation. Obviously, with that anticipation, I, a little bit of worry that it's going to fall flat. I, I, it just it just happens. But I don't think it is. But there's still that because there's such high expectations for it. Um, the preview. Yes, the preview. I'll give you guys an example. Thor number two from 2020 was a preview of strange Academy and that thing is holding value as well for what it is. Huh. I mean, it doesn't have a lot. So, but it's, it's a preview of something modern. So this creep show is going to be a preview of something modern transformers. Um, so yeah, I, I definitely, I, I agree with that pick. You, I've been seeing it on, on Instagram all day, all week about it to get it, to get creep show. I want to get creep show just cause I want to get creep show. Like, but that, that it has a preview. It's also like a bonus for me. Um, and then the thing about Transformer too, there's gonna there's a lot of there's a lot of covers. There's also a lot of uh, ratio covers. So if you really want to look at something that's that's character defining, get some of those ratio covers. Spend a little bit more up front. You know the one in twenty five, one in fifty. I think there's a one in one hundred as well. Um, and and maybe get yourself in on the on the ground floor of that. If if it is what it's you know trending to be. Then I mean you might be looking at at at, at a good um, return on that down the line if it's if it's if it's character defining and what what they're saying that it's going to be and what the reviews are saying that it's going to be then yeah try to try to get in on some of those ratio covers if you can. Yeah. No, I think what's int- I, I'm try- I'm sitting here trying to think and I'm like Creep Show is an '80s classic, Transformers is an '80s classic, but I feel like you're looking at at least ten years apart in the different. You're, you're, yeah, you're trying to to string those together and i agree with you i don't i don't i don't really see it but that you're you know what the 80s classic at least is closer than i got to connecting those yeah. two. <laughs> um, yeah, kevin you know. bacon is in there somewhere there's uh, yeah it's it's a <laughs> show kevin bacon transformers that's probably it. oh but i agree that's also like that and gi joe are both books that they're such comic stalwarts for like i guess going on 40 years that it's it's but they're they're so monolithic it's like this is this is the rare true entry point for something that typically runs in like decade long i mean even larry hama is continuing his run on gi joe at like the third publisher so it's (laughs) it's characters i i like and have a childhood connection to but but having a nice fresh place to start because even though i i mentioned the idw archives earlier 
those things go out of print fast. Like you can't get them. It, certainly now that it, they don't hold the license, but even when they were coming out, I mean, you're talking like 25 plus volume series. So having that fresh place to start is a very exciting thing. I am looking forward to it just for the reading. Uh, it is, it is one of the more hyped up books, but I look forward to it. And Daniel Warren Johnson has just destroyed on some of his recent works. And I mean that in a good way, like that guy is just a one man wrecking crew. It feels like when it comes to writing and understanding how to weave characters, cannot wait to see what he does with the transformers. And hopefully all of, not all of it is, you know, heartfelt, you know, stuff you love that I want him to do things with characters that people are like, no, you ruined Ironhide for me. Or something. like, I, you know, I want him to get in there and, kind of make it his own do what he wants with the characters and and i can't wait to see it so we'll we'll see what happens all right that is going to do it that that is going to wrap up this episode of Spectales. jordan thank you very much for joining us it was so much fun getting to know you and and learning about your grail tales or your or your whale tales maybe in this case and we will do our best to will those things into existence for you hopefully Mm -hmm. Uh, it doesn't take years uh, for those to come through. Uh, would you like to, would you please share where people can find you on the internet if you, if they so choose? Yeah, it is. Uh, it's weird. It's a weird time to pitch socials, but I am on Blue Sky now. Um, just Jordan Elsega. I'm also learning Instagram, also at Jordan Elsega. I'm still on Twitter because I haven't left the sinking ship yet. Uh, that's at Indigo Master, E-N-D-I-G-O-M-A-S-T-E-R. Um, who knows for how much longer I'm really trying to shift because of everything. Um, and then my website is jordanelsaka.com, uh, pretty just just my name, .com. And that's where I try to uh, keep everything up to date. Uh, you'll, you'll see what I'm working on as soon as it gets announced there, but also on social media. And thank thanks for having me. This, is, this has been a great experience. I... Uh, I really appreciate just taking the time and, and it's, it's, I'm, I'm just excited the books out there and, and getting to talk comics. Like I said, uh, I forget if I said, if I said this when we started or before we recorded, but it is always exciting to talk comics. So I'm, I'm, I had a good time. Anytime to have an excuse. And I, I don't know if you had said it before or now, but we've said it again at the very least. <laughs> uh, and uh, last but not least, once again, cooking with monsters, uh, Jordan's book, it is already on store shelves. Well, if it's still there, like in my, my LCS was sold out, but that is a very, very good indication. This is a great book. Uh, it is for adults and young adults. It, it is appropriate for all ages. And I think that it's, it's a great read. So if it has piqued your interest in any way, shape or form, highly recommend you act on that and go out and get, grab it. Uh, and I believe, yes, it's also available on Amazon and, you know, all the digital places as well. Uh, that's it. Thanks very much, Jordan. Thanks, Jesus, again for always showing up, you know, as you do. Uh, I, I realize I never thank you at the end of these episodes. I'm always just like, all right, we're done. Uh, but, yeah, thank you so much. We will catch all of you next week. Bye.